Welcome again. And we say Shabbat Shalom, or we say Happy Sabbath, or we can say good morning. And uh, it's been a while since I've been here because of the origins meetings the last two weekends, and the weekend before that I was away as well. But those went well, so we have those on our prayer list to pray for the aftermath of those meetings. Because we have some young people that are interested, and we're going to do Shadow Empire with them. You've all done that before, so that's a good follow-up to teach the history of Christianity in the early centuries. And we've got Jackson back there in the sound booth for us. Our Father in Heaven, we're so grateful to be alive today on this year, Holy Sabbath Day. We ask your blessing as we worship you, Lord, for you are worthy of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. So our response to reading is men and women. Open your hymnal to number 769. It's a modification of what we call the Sabbath blessings. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. By Christ all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all things on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it the holy. Six days shall shall they In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. So our opening hymn is what we'll go to next, and that's number 86, How Great Thou Art. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. <laughs>
again. And happy Sabbath. You know, this morning we are just we are just blessed this morning. We have a lot of visitors this morning. We want to thank uh, Brother Joseph and his family, uh, Sister Patricia and Elon. Ethan with us this morning. We're glad to have y'all with us this morning. And we also want to thank our other friend, and well, she been here a long time. So Folk Valley right there, glad to have y'all with us this morning. And also, just bless again to see our other brother, Brother Steve, back with us this morning. Amen. Glad to have you with us, Brother Steve. Glad to have you with us. And another thing, this morning, Pastor, I forgot about Teddy, Miss B, she called. And she said she was intending to come, but she had to leave emergency last night. But don't forget about uh, Thurston. If Thursday at 5 o'clock, she'll have a, a student here. Oh, the graduation's here? Right. Thursday at this 5 thir o'clock. Right. Ah. And she said, don't forget that you're on program also. The problem with Thursday, you have to tell her, that's the day of Tracy's operation. Oh, okay. Then. And uh, she's going in the morning, and I'm not sure what, what time is that graduation? At 5, at 5 o'clock. Right. Yeah, so you might have to stand in for me. I don't know if I can make it, to tell you the truth. Um, okay. Hannah is here to help, but uh, that's going to be a pretty busy day. Our offer will be for the Georgia Cummins Ministry Offer Evangelism. It says, in 2022, the Georgia Cummins Company, the Southern Union and the Southern Adventist University are working together in evangelism in Northeast region of Tennessee. Ten churches will all be joined together and conduct meetings at the same time this May and June. Church members, pastors, and Southern Adventist University students will be making friends, engaging community, and then preaching the word. Preaching the word. What a powerful partnership in the mission. Sharing the joy of Christ's soon return and the power of his transforming grace. By ourselves, none of us could probably carry on and support such a large evangelism effort in the northeast part of Tennessee. But together, we can. Amen. We definitely remember her in our prayer this morning. Sure we are. You know, I have two, two prayers this morning. You know, my prayer is always military personnel and their spouse, actually, and trust veterans. And this morning I was listening to uh, Doug Batchelor this morning, you know, coming up Monday be Memorial Day. But like Doug Batchelor said, God made a Memorial Day when he said the fourth commandment, remember, you know. Mm -hmm. Memorial Day is to remember the soldiers that have lost their lives, but God had already put a Memorial Day in place when he said, remember the Sabbath day. And also this morning, we want to continue to remember the people in Ukraine. Amen. But most of all, Remember those who are 19 kids in Texas and the two school teachers. Amen. But anyway, this morning we'll remember their parents. This morning they also the family to another. I know that we all have unspoken prayer this morning. So maybe God will hear the prayer this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you again, Lord, we just want to thank you for this day right now, Father. Father, we just want to thank you for the people that are here today. We just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. The work in the war that is in Ukraine, remember that family, all those people in Ukraine, Lord. And don't forget those people in Texas, Lord, those kids and their family, Lord. Take away their pain, Lord. Ease their fear and let them and us know that you are the great healer and our way, there, and our way will be there. We pray this prayer. And that's son, Jesus Christ's name. Lord, and don't forget all his pastor this morning. And his wife, Tracy, Father, continue to lay your hand on, on him and continue to bless, bless her and heal her, Father. And all these blessings we ask in that son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 We do have a youngster here today, so Ethan, consider this your children's story. All right, so adults, think about this, Ethan. Adults are going to sing the song, Jesus Loves Me. And why do we love to sing this song? Because we really believe that Jesus loves us. 
And that's what we need more than anything is the love of God. Isn't that right? Amen. And if our children see us loving Jesus like we want them to love Jesus, wow, imagine how the world can be changed. Imagine how the world can be changed. Jesus loves me. Today is a little bit different type of sermon. You know, we get together Wednesdays for our prayer meeting, and it's on Zoom. And usually when I come here, Richard's the only one here with me. But if other people wanted to come here, I'd come. But it's just easier with gas being $6 a gallon some places, you know, safer on the roads. Think about, wow, all the violence going on in the world right now. We've been looking at Genesis in the Sabbath School Quarterly. I've been talking about creation for quite some time. And I'm looking right here for Colossians chapter 1. Because the verses we read for the call to worship, that's where I'm preaching from today. And think about what God said in Noah's time, why he destroyed the earth by a flood. Why the judgment? You remember? Because the earth was filled with? With wickedness or with violence. And it was corrupt. And as I was teaching these origin seminar, these six meetings we just had at the Griffin Church, we learned that the word corrupt, the earth was corrupt, also means decay. So the earth was decaying. Now evolution says that we're getting better and better. We started out some type of germ or mollusk, and eventually it turned into a human, right? But the truth is, there is an evolution, but it's in reverse. We're getting worse and worse. And the only reason we live longer today than human beings did, oh, a couple hundred years ago, do you know why? If you look at the average lifespan, they say our average lifespan is longer 77, I believe it is right now, somewhere around there. Uh, when I was very young, it was 70. And back in the 1950s, it might have been 65 or 60. And in the 1920s, even less. Well, you know, people who live a long time always have been living a long time. Think of Benjamin Franklin. He was in his 80s before he passed away. And that was way back in the early ages of America when we did not have modern medicine and things like that. So what is it about the average age? Why are we living longer? The Bible says that Adam lived 930 years. The Bible says Methuselah lived 969 years. And even after the flood, Noah lived 500 more years after the flood. And we can see in the genealogy, the ages are going down. Now, the earth was so violent when God destroyed it by a flood these people had been living for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they were doing all kinds of wickedness and violence. They were not glorifying God. They didn't care about God. They wanted to do away with God. Evidence is that after the flood, after they repopulated the earth, then a group got together and wanted to build a tower, the Tower of Babel, 
to find out what's going on up there and to get away from any possible flood because they did not trust the rainbow promise. That God said, you know, I promise I will never flood the earth again, but they didn't trust him. Seems like the habit and practice of human beings is ever to go away from God. God finds us, and he knocks on the doors of our hearts. And for those of us who've come to Jesus in faith, we know that. And we yearn for those outside the ark of safety, as Miss Martha would always say, especially of our loved ones, our relatives. We yearn for them, and they don't seem so bad, you know, they, they, but they're outside. And if the world was different, back like it was in Noah's day, we'd find them joining in on what's called violence. And we're finding today with this shooting in Texas, Uvalde, Texas, wow, what would drive an 18-year-old? I mean, come on, this is satanic, pure, plain, and simple. And we've seen more and more and more of this to go shoot up the place knowing he's going to die. And, you, you know, almost every one, most of them who've shot up places have committed suicide afterwards. Way back in 1998 when that shooting in Littleton, Colorado started with those two kids, they killed themselves afterwards. That somehow they think they're going to be famous. They don't know about the judgment. They get an idea from the world that God's not really there. You know, the watchmaker God or no God at all, as evolution teaches. All this stuff has really started to come the more that they teach that God is not real. And the world teaches that. Every animal video you watch is going to have something about we were descended from grasshoppers or something like that. Of course, you know I'm being facetious here, but it's not, not too different. It's not too different. Where, where is our hope? The title of my sermon today is, what did I just do with my bulletin? Praying what we believe. Praying what we believe. And so, y'all know what's been going on. In early America, people lived through different forms of violence. And you could say, you, I could have said it then. You all know what's going on. And then we seem to get a little bit of a reprieve, and then it goes on again. But this is a different type of violence. This is not even like it was when it was racial back in the 1920s and 30s. When, what, you remember that Oklahoma thing, you know, that, that, that special town in Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street, they called it. And... Caucasian people went in and pretty much did mayhem back there. Hundreds were killed. And that was kept silent for years. You remember that story, right? So does that mean we're more violent today than back then? Well, we were pretty violent back then. Think of the Civil War in this country, north and south. Why would a country tear apart and fight with each other? We understand war and that type of violence, but the violence we're seeing today there's an added dimension that's different. It's just random. It's crazy. Nobody is safe. Go to a shopping mall, you might get shot up. Go to the pharmacy, you might get shot up. Attend church, you might get shot up. In the schools, well, who would want to send their kids to any school today? I was a teacher in the public schools in Los Angeles. I wouldn't put my kids in the school. I'd, I'd rather homeschool them and know they're safe there. How can we protect ourselves? You know, the random break-ins into houses and things. You know, uh, it was back in the 1960s, a man by the name of Charles Manson and a whole bunch of followers broke into rich people's homes, actresses' homes, and murdered and killed them. Just horrible crime. But we're seeing it multiply, just like the earthquakes are multiplying, just like the hurricanes are multiplying. How do we deal with the violence? Is this something we can vote about? Whether you're for gun control or against gun control, can you vote it? Can you vote a politician in the office who can promise you safety? And you might be able to resolve a few things, but you can't resolve the human heart. What is it that's causing people who don't, in the past, people who did not know God, did not do things like this, there was a check on them. Only a few did these crazy outlandish acts of violence. You know, we call them names like Jack the Ripper. And they were well known. But now we're seeing multiple young people, and I'm saying multiple, looking over the last 20, 25 years, who want to get famous on social media before they die. Who knows why this kid goes into a fourth grade classroom and just murders people he did not even know. Kids. 
kids. One girl was so traumatized, you probably read about it, she dipped herself in her friend's blood, her friend who was lying there dead, fearing the shooter might come back in the classroom. Think about the trauma. How are we as Christians to reach out to those who've been through such kinds of trauma? And especially to reach out to other Christians who have a little bit different faith than we do. They don't know about the judgment going on right now, the good judgment, the judgment of the saints, the judgment you want to be in. They don't know about that. They might know about Jesus, but they don't know about him as the creator of heavens and earth because they might also believe in evolution, or they don't know about him to keep the Sabbath holy. They say it doesn't matter what day you keep. And we as Seventh-day Adventists, we have taken and looked at all the evidence and determined, no, this is the right faith. Keep all God's commandments. Follow Jesus all the way. And we need to understand more and more his love, his grace, because we can tend to be outside the cup people. You know, that's what the Pharisees were. Jesus said, salvation's of the Jews. Do you remember who he told that to? He told it to the woman at the well. She was from Samaria. Salvation's not of your faith. You don't have the whole Bible. The Samaritans only had the first five books of Moses. They did not use Isaiah. They did not use Jeremiah. They did not use the book of Daniel. They didn't believe in them. And Jesus told her, you don't have all the truth. The Jews have all the truth. They may not be right here in their heart. But salvations of the Jews, Jesus did not mean that they're perfect and they're saved. He meant that they have the secrets of salvation. When he talked to that woman at the well, he was pointing to himself. I who speak to you am he. But they all, those Pharisees, only a few of them know about me. Nicodemus later. Joseph Arimathea later. But most of them didn't want anything to do with Jesus. These were the ones who had the truth, but it was an outside of the cup form. They didn't know about their own hearts. That's just something we have to search. If we're going to reach the world, first of all, our hearts have to be right, melted before God. We might intellectually know the right doctrine. You can share it all you want with people. But if your heart's not converted, you have a less likelihood of helping them to be converted. The first important thing is for us to know Jesus. And so what I'm going to share with you today, what we read at the call to worship even, those verses from Nehemiah chapter 9, from Colossians chapter 1, from Exodus chapter 20, from Genesis chapter 2. These verses, you can read them there, look at, open your hymnal there to 769 and look at the end. You'll see where the verses come from, number 769. And it tells you, even gives you the order. And I want to look first at Colossians chapter 1, because I think that sets the stage. And then I want to look at that story in Nehemiah chapter 9, which we hinted at the bottom there. So let's first look at Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Who was created in the image of God? Do you remember? Human beings. We did not descend from apes or from mullahs or from germs. We were created in the image of God. And yet Jesus is the express image. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Was Jesus born? Did I stump you? Was Jesus born? No. He was born on earth. Right? So he was born. But he wasn't born in eternity. He always was. I understand that. But was he born as a human being? He was. Is that what firstborn means? Because Jesus was not first in chronological order, was he? When he was born in Mary's womb, was he first? No, so firstborn is not chronological order. And firstborn does not even mean born like we understand a baby being born from a woman, from her womb. Firstborn is a title. It is he is first in order. When I was teaching about origins, we learned the dinosaurs. You know, God created some magnificent creatures. And some, some of them were probably on the ark. Maybe God left some off the ark. Maybe some were not direct creations of his. Maybe the violent ones, I don't know. But some were on the ark. And there's evidence that meteors were flying through space and hitting the earth during the flood and after the flood. And even evolutionary science and creation scientists 
tend to agree that a cataclysm destroyed the dinosaurs. They were destroyed all at once. Was it a combination of the flood and meteors or meteors after the flood? Was it the ice age for the wo woolly mammoths? You know, these are all hypotheses. But there's good reason to believe it. Adventists have an intelligent faith about this. We do not turn our eyes against evolution. I taught my students two words about evolution. One was microevolution, one was macroevolution. Seventh day Adventists are intelligent. We know, and I know because I've studied it, I'm, I'm my background science. We know microevolution happens. Sparrows can change into different forms of sparrows, but they're never going to change into a crow. And that's pretty close. And definitely, the sparrow will never become a monkey. A tomato will never become a human being. You understand? That's macroevolution. Macroevolution is, is really what evolution is talking about, that lower life forms can turn into higher life forms. No evidence of that, but there's plenty of evidence for microevolutions. Small changes within the species. Darwin saw multiple finches. He didn't even know there were finches. He took those birds back to England and said, what are these to an ornithologist, a bird expert? Oh, those are all finches. Really? Why do they look so different? Some had big beaks. Some had little beaks. Some had medium-sized beak adapted to what they ate, but they were all finches. You see, there was probably a common ancestor, Darwin thought, and he was probably right about that, except he took that common ancestor thing and said, well, there's a common ancestor for all life. We all descended from some primordial soup somewhere and branched off into the various forms of life from the lowly worms and trilobites on up to the reptilian, the lizards, the snakes, the dinosaurs, on up to the mammals and the fish of the sea and the mammals advanced eventually into apes and apes and humans branched off somewhere and wow, anyway not getting too much into that but you understand we have a commonality. We know that dogs, the puppies, all look a little bit different, don't they? We know we can breed and make a breed like German Shepherds or Pit Bulls or, or American Bullies or, or little itty bitty Chihuahuas and, and various kinds of Chihuahuas. That's called breeding. The genetics change. There's adaptation. That's called microevolution. Otherwise, all your children would always look exactly like you. Exactly like you. When bacteria multiply, one bacteria can turn into two. It just divides itself. They're identical. They're identical. That's not the case with human beings. We have some identities, right? So we understand that God created a wonderful diversity within creation. And so when we say that human beings were created in the image of God, we look to Jesus who became a man he condescended to become one of us. He lowered himself, the Bible says, and came to this earth, became one of us. And Paul's writing here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God. By him, verse 16, all things were created. All these things I was talking about, the end of all, they were created. After they were created, there was probably some change. Maybe some cows grew longer horns. Maybe some cows grew shorter horns. Maybe buffalo and cows came from the same ancestors. Maybe oxen. Maybe tigers and lions came from the same ancestors. There's evidence they can breed, you know. Horses and donkeys can breed. And, and you know, the, the baby, if it's, I forget which one, if it's, if it's a female baby or a male baby, one is sterile, one is not. Tigers and lions breed. It's called a liger, the offspring. They have common genes, but the offspring is sterile. There's indications that way back when in time, when the world was more perfect, probably there was more interbreeding between animals, creating various kinds, other kinds. But God, in the original creation, and the original creation of man, and pointing to Jesus, says he is the one we all were created after. If we were created in God's image, and Jesus is the image of God, then we're created after his image. So when Jesus came to earth, we know what God looks like. Two arms, two legs, a head because we're, we're made to look like him. Of course, you all know we lost something, right? Well, actually, you and I didn't lose anything. We never had it. But Adam and Eve lost something. They lost their clothing. What kind of clothes were they wearing before? Yeah, it had to be a clothing of light like the angels wear. And that's what's going to be restored. We'll, we will one day be fully restored to the image of God. Again, now, you know all this. I don't mean to pump you up, but I'm thinking of those kids that were shot and killed in Texas. Did they know it? 
Do their parents know it? Do the ones grieving know it? Like we know it. All kinds of faith groups competing to give their story. And a lot of people are looking at the different Christians and saying, well, how do we know God's a loving God? Because look at the way y'all act. Image of the invisible God. The way Jesus acts, that's the way I want to act. How about you? It says here in verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And even that scoundrel Satan was made, originally crafted by Jesus himself. The Bible doesn't tell us how God created the angels. We just know he spoke them into existence, the angelic host. Did he speak them? Did he form them with his hands like he did Adam? Did he form them with his hands like he did the rib that turned into Eve? Because the animals he spoke, the land he spoke, the waters he spoke, the fish of the sea he spoke. So we're not told everything. We're just given little snapshots. The rest we believe by faith. But he definitely made the angels. And Satan was the highest angel of all when his name was Lucifer, the light bearer of God. Why was, something with air, why was someone with everything had the most responsibility? He was the leader in heaven. Angels love to obey his voice. It's written in Patriarchs and Prophets. There was order in heaven. God is a God of order. And it's not that those that are obeying Lucifer are, are underlings. It's not that they're less important. God creates for a purpose. Look, we, mankind, we're made lower than the angels, the Bible tells us, right? Yet we're made in the image of God. So that technically means angels, in a way, could be our boss. You know, if you saw a vision of an angel, you'd probably fall on your face. Oh, no, no, you know, right? Like Daniel did, like Isaiah did. There's order, and there will always be order. There's order on earth. I'm a pastor. Richard's an elder. You know, there's order. We, we have let this parents and there's children. What is the biggest problem, what I'm getting at here, what is the biggest problem within this system of order, God's order? It's the problem of rebellion. It's the problem of disobedience. Satan disobeyed, and God still had mercy on him and, and, and and extended his arm out of mercy for a long time, didn't he? So it's always rebellion. The, the self rises up. Pride rises up. I want my way. All the problems we have in the church, 90% of them or more, are because of self rising up and wanting self's way over someone else's self. Or maybe the church council you know, votes a certain thing and others rise up against it. You, you understand what I'm saying? All the problems we have in church stem from that including in the Adventist church. Think about this general conference votes that are going to be coming up this next month. There's a lot of pushback, and there always is, because and it's not that that's bad, but the way it's done could be. If it's done out of someone wants to trumpet their view and slanders the other person or says this about, you know what I'm saying? But we're created in the image of God, the image of the invisible God, and he's the firstborn it says, over all creation, that includes over the animals, the dinosaurs, Ellen White has written, the, and the Bible confirms. God says it in Job chapter 40 about this, have you considered the behemoth, or sometimes called Leviathan? We don't know what that was. It certainly wasn't a hippopotamus. It moves its tail like a cedar. What kind of tail does a hippo have? Hippos are very strong. But this was something that had a tail like a cedar. It was probably some form of large dinosaur with a huge long tail. Some of these dinosaurs get to be 130 feet long. And God said to Job, he is the first of the ways of God, the primary animal on the earth, the most magnificent creature. These bones that are discovering the earth kind of hint to that. Now, we think of that, compare that to here, Jesus. Jesus is the first of the way, and he's first in the human line. He became firstborn for our sakes. Do you understand? Amen. Let me say it again. He became firstborn. He took this title for our sakes. He didn't need that title. He's eternal God. He's one with the Father. When he came to this earth, every title he took was for our sake, for man's salvation, including every person who's ever been shot up and killed or in war or in violence in the earth or in gangs. Jesus came that his name may be known, that God's name should be glorified so that 
his people, whoever his people may be, will somehow be able to share the story of this God, this Jesus, who is above all things, who created all things, who's before all things, and yet he's a merciful and loving friend. He's a father. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. And he's Jesus. Amen. Whose name means God is salvation. His very name means I'm your salvation. The same God who came looking for Adam in the garden after the sin. Adam was hiding. Where are you? Is looking for human beings today. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, verse 17. And in him all things consist. You know, the only reason the earth continued after sin, because God said, if you eat of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis chapter 2 told it directly to Adam before he made Eve even. If you eat of that tree, the day you eat of it, what will happen? You will die. And that day they started to die. They lost their eternal club covering. They lost part of the, a big part of the image of God. But why did they not die permanently on the spot? Because of mercy. Because God's mercy triumphed. Because Jesus had already made the promise. A secret counsel that Satan was not allowed to go into when he was Lucifer what made Satan so jealous, why he became Satan. Why can I go into the secret counsel of God? Why is the Son of God in there? Why is it the Father and the Son? I'm as important as him. He did not understand. He didn't care to understand. All he wanted to do was take God's place. He wanted to ascend to the stars of the Lord. He wanted to sit on the farthest sides of the north, as it says in Isaiah 14. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to take the Most High's place. It wasn't just Jesus he was after. It was the Father, too. Upset the whole thing. He lost. He got cast out of heaven. He took dominion here by deceiving Adam and Eve. Not our fault, but we're born into it. But Jesus knows that. Why are we even alive today? Why did earth continue? Because of God's mercy. Everyone who's ever been born after Adam and Eve were created, starting with Cain and Abel, has been born because of God's mercy. Do you believe that? Amen. Even the murderers, even the bad ones, even the criminals who are as wicked as Cain was who killed his own brother. They've been born because of God's mercy. Each one born has a chance at salvation. And why is it going on so long? Why this wickedness increasing? Well, you know, the signs of this wickedness increasing are signs of the same sign that Noah, who preached how many years? 120 years? The same sign that one day it's going to end and God's going to shut that door. The ark of safety will be closed. And right now the ark of safety is not a boat that floats. It's Jesus. It's the cross of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. It's believing in him and keeping all his commandments. Not that we brag that we're saved because we keep his commandments. Why do we keep his commandments? Because we know he loves us and we love him in return. Because why do we worship him? Not because we're afraid, because we know he's worthy of worship. How do you know he's worthy of worship? What can you tell others about this God? So they could see that picture too. The same picture you and I see. The Seventh-day Adventists collectively should see. God is relying on his people to preach the last message of mercy to a dying planet. Verse 18, And he is the head of of the what? What's it say? What's your Bible say? Of the, of the body. What's the body? Maybe I should say, who's the body? The church. The church. Who's the church? We are. we are. Now, I know a lot of different church groups believe that. A lot of different faith groups believe that. But you know something more. You know that the three angels' message, the last message, is important to God, don't you? You believe that or you probably wouldn't be Seventh-day Adventist. Not every Seventh-day Adventist knows this. Some people want to change the, the beliefs and doctrines. They think they, they know better. But uh, this is the present truth message. The judgment has already begun. It's a good judgment. 
It's the judgment in favor of the saints. When it is over, probation closes, and Jesus is about ready to come again. The Bible says in Revelation, there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. Prophetic half hour is a couple weeks in time. Maybe it's only two weeks be between when probation closes and Jesus comes. I don't know. Maybe shorter. Maybe longer. But you all know, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you believe that probation will close before Jesus comes. Not like most of the Christian world believes that there will be a secret rapture, but then people on earth will be left behind and given a second chance. No, there is no second chance. The second chance is when? Right now, because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Oh, what can we do, O oh Lord? We're so feeble and weak. We know these things. And we know people don't want to listen to us all the time. How can we reach them? How can we have your love in us, Jesus, like you had for people? How can we have patience like you had? How can we have mercy like you had? Not condemnation, not judgmentalism. How can we tell them about this God of love who's wanting to judge in their favor right now if they only come into the ark of safety, if they only will accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? And believe in this message that you've given for the last days. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, before I close, I want to just tell you, go to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah, right after Ezra and Nehemiah, these books that go together. You know, they're rebuilding the temple. You know the book of Daniel. We know it well. Daniel who prayed in Daniel chapter 9, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Daniel chapter 9, there's another chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, where Nehemiah prays almost the same thing that Daniel prayed. We have sinned. Our fathers have sinned. Lord, how can you accept us? Nehemiah chapter 9. And we read it here in our, part of it in our um, call to worship, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You, well, let me not go to the last part, because that goes on down. So that starts in verse 6. And that goes through to the end of verse 6. It's all of verse 6. And then that last part where it says, you may know to them your holy Sabbath, you have to look all the way down to verse 14 to find that. Look at everything that comes in between. Nehemiah is doing a much better job than me. Something I tried to do as I began this sermon, just to rehearse what God has done, the goodness of God versus what the lies that are on the outside that say, no, God didn't do it, evolution did it, or something else. Nehemiah is rehearsing and remembering how God led his people. Look at verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram. Notice he says Abram. Now he knows his name is Abraham, but when he says Abram, he's referring to when he first chose him before he changed his name to Abraham. You brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He's rehearsing the history of Abraham. Verse 8, you found his heart what? What does it say? Faithful. Faithful. Isn't that what we want to have, the faith of Abraham? Or as it says in Revelation 14, 12, the close of the three angels' message, here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the faith of Abraham. Many of us, Seventh day Adventists, when I was young in the faith, have focused so much on the commandments and they lose sight of the faith of Jesus. And I say they because I've heard it so much. And I had to work hard to gain sight of the faith of Jesus. You cannot separate the two out. Otherwise, we become outside of the cup Christians, outside the cup Adventists, who never look at the heart. When people come into our churches and they look different than us, maybe they're wearing jewelry, maybe they're wearing different kinds of clothes, and, you know, they can feel that judgment. Oh, they should feel an acceptance instead. We should have years of patience with people because Jesus had years of patience with us. Has he not? My goodness, I'm 65 years old. I've been a Seventh-day Adventist going on 43 years now. 
I chose to become an Adventist at the age of 22. Before that, I considered myself a Christian, but I didn't know the truth like I know now. But I do know one thing. I knew the love of God. I didn't live it perfectly, but I knew it because I was taught it in my youth. And I know something else. Something you all should know. Something we all should know. God had mercy on me. A lot of mercy. You know, I didn't become a pastor officially until I was 50. I attended ceremony, seminary. I enrolled at the age of 46 and entered at the age of 47, graduated at the age of 50, got a call down here to Georgia at the age of 50. Why? God called me out of a teaching career, a successful teaching career in L.A., which is much more financially lucrative than being a pastor. And he gets summers off. God called me out. And I knew when I came into this faith that this is the real deal. My struggle is to share it. My struggle is how can I convince others? It was hard for me to convince people in my own family, my brothers, my sister, my parents, my grandparents, and now nephews and nieces. And now even my children who are raised in the faith, you know, there's one that's kind of outside, well, she's outside the faith. So I talked to my grandchildren. How can I convince them about what I know in my heart about this God of love? Do you have an answer? Do you know how? Are you as frustrated as me? I'm not frustrated with God. I'm frustrated with me. I'm inadequate. Nehemiah prays, we have sinned. Look, he, he says here, he's got all these men, the, these leaders, who are standing up and reading from the book of the law of the Lord their God. And they were re reading from this book, it says in verse 3, one-fourth of the day. And for another fourth of the day, it says, they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Nehemiah knew that repentance and reformation were needed. And they all came together, they're reading out loud, because not everyone has a Bible, so they have to hear it. And all these men's names are mentioned, and the Levites are mentioned there in verses 4 and 5. And then they say together, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. I mean, as much as you want to bless God and praise God, his name is exalted above that. We can't overdo it. We can be silly about it, and that doesn't bring God honor, but we can't overdo it. And then he says, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts. Remember Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. All things were made through him and for him. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts. The earth and everything on it. The seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all by his mercy. Preserving human beings who don't deserve to be preserved because they're working against God. They might hate God. They might be atheistic and many other things. But he's preserving them for a time until their time is up. And you and I don't know their time. We don't even know our own, our own time. All I know is right now. I know what I should be doing right now because God has convicted me of that. If I'm not given tomorrow, I pray I'm in his wonderful mercy and in his salvation because I know I'm not worthy. But it makes me love him all the more. I want to do something for those children of future Uvalde, Texas, before they become victims. The host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God, verse 7. And he goes through more history. He goes through the history of, of Moses and calling him out of Egypt, repeating it again. The psalmist repeats it. Nehemiah repeats it. He says in verse 10, You showed them signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of this land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. Speaking of the Egyptians acting proudly against the Israelites, even though the Israelites were not perfect. They weren't good. They weren't even keeping the Sabbath. They didn't even know about it. They'd forgotten about it. They weren't obeying God's law, but God chose them. God made a promise to Abraham. Now he's trying to bring them out. And he's hoping when he brings them out that they will learn 
that he really is a loving God and he wants their best interests and that they will also learn he wants to use them as his servants to preach to the rest of the world, to teach the rest of the world, to show the rest of the world mercy and love, at the same time preaching justice and showing justice. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, what is Micah, right? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice or justly and to love mercy? Not just to be merciful, but to actually love it. We can all be merciful, do an act of mercy, but do we love it? If you don't love being merciful, that means you need to pray. If I don't, and I don't always love being merciful, I'm confessing. It's hard sometimes to be merciful. So I have to pray to God, Lord, I need to love mercy. How can I love mercy for those I don't love mercy for? And God changes my heart. Over and over again, I need my heart changed. Is that true for you too? Each day is a new conversion. Read his word because even though you know the facts, even though you know what it says, you don't know what it says unless you read it again because it's going to speak to you in a new way. Your heart will be pricked. You'll say, oh, Lord, like Nehemiah is doing here. Verse 13, you came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, even though they didn't appreciate it. Good statutes and commandments. You made known to them, what's it say? Your holy Sabbath, which has never been done away with. And you and I know that, but the rest of the Christian world doesn't know it. What's it going to take? How are we going to be able to reach our brothers and sisters in the other Christian churches? I only have one answer. It's going to take some serious prayer. We pray here on Wednesday evenings on Zoom, and we talk about these things, and we pray for each other, and we pray for healings. And we get sick. And you see, I have this thing on here because I have some weird wrist injury going on. I don't know what I did, but last night I made it worse by sleeping. And I woke up, and that hurts. I must have bent it, and I, I put this on to keep myself from bending. It's weak. It's got swelling. And I, I don't know what I did. I must have hit it on a doorknob somewhere. You know what I mean? I don't know what I did. I got this right eye that just doesn't see well. And my doctor left. He was right there in Griffin, and he moved away to another location. And I don't trust a new doctor I'm not going to go to the same office. Oh, Dr. So-and-so left, so come and make an appointment with Dr. So-and-so. Oh, no, let me wait on that. You know, what I, Joyce knows what I'm talking about. We just don't trust ourselves to just any old doctor. We want a relationship with that doctor, and people won't trust our God unless they have a relationship with you. And the relationship develops really in pain and effort because they're not like us. And you don't want to become like them but you want to be able to minister to them. You want to be their friend. Jesus was friends with a lot of people who weren't converted. He was definitely friendly towards them, was he not? I want the faith of Jesus. I want the faith of Abraham. I want the faith of the person who is the image of the invisible God. I want them to see God's image in me because I'm pretty ugly. I don't have that clothing of light. But God can do something in each one of us that they can see our heart. So as I close, let me tell you this story. My grandchildren, my youngest daughter has been down to help us the last two weekends so I could do those origins meetings because it was Friday and Sabbath and I couldn't be away from Tracy that long. That back injury is that bad. She's, she's, she's disabled. She needed help. So they came Friday. Well, this weekend, last night, my oldest daughter came and Hannah's going to stay with us for the next few weeks as long as we need her because the surgery is next Thursday. Well, I'm trying to reach my grandchildren. Maya and Isabel, these girls, beautiful girls. Yeah, I'm talking physically beautiful. They're physically beautiful. They're, they're 13 and 12 years old. They come into the room. And I know their mother has not taught them Adventist things, even though she was raised in the Adventist church. I know they did not hear about the Sabbath from their mother. They heard about it from their cousin one day. And so Yaya, that's Greek for grandma and myself, we struggle with how, how, how do we reach them. I call them into the bedroom Tracy and I were still laying in the bed. Come here. And I looked him in the eye and I said, do you know how beautiful you are? Do you know how beautiful you both are? And they're girls. And they're physically beautiful girls, so you know what they're going to say. Yeah. Well, how do you know? 
because we get told all the time. They, told you, they tell you that, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. I said, yeah, you're physically beautiful. You really are. I'm talking about your heart. I see a beauty in your heart. I talked to them about the difference between a beautiful heart and an ugly heart. I said, you know when you meet somebody who has an ugly heart, don't you? You can tell. They have an ugly heart. God wants you to have a beautiful heart. And as the future unwinds and you grow up, your heart can change and become ugly. And you can still be physically beautiful. But God wants you to have a beautiful heart. And that comes from learning of Jesus. And I told him a few other things too, but I'm just leaving that with you now. I want all of us to have this beautiful heart. I pray for a beautiful heart. The people can see the Holy Spirit in me. They can see Jesus in me. That they'll want to know more. That they'll want to ask. And that's why I leave us. Anybody else have that same prayer? We're going to sing our closing hymn. And then I'm going to have Richard give the benediction. He's going to pray for us. Okay, our closing hymn is, It is well with my soul. Gracious heaven, the Father, as we come to the conclusion of this service, Father. Right now, Father, I just hope that everyone feel that it is well with our soul today, Father. Amen. After having a good message today, Lord, we just want to thank you for all that you have blessed us with, Father. We thank you for the guests that we had. There was a blessing to have them, and Father. And as we leave the church today, Father, I hope that we can go out there and spread your word and spread your love. Let yes. them know, regardless of how bad it seems, it still is well with our soul as long as we got you Hold on to your righteous hand, Father. And all these blessings we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.